I want, I want to uh, tell a, a really uh, old joke that I've told before, but um, if you've heard it before, it's an illustration. If you haven't heard it before, then it's a joke. <laughs> but the uh, illustration slash joke goes like this. There's a guy that is out of work, uh, probably a construction worker in Hawaii, and, uh, <laughs> and anyway, he, he sees that there's, a, there's a, an advertisement for work at the local zoo, so he goes down finds out all the jobs or, or the job he was hoping to get is already taken. But the guy says, but, uh, uh, you know, you're a pretty big guy. We've actually got one more job that's available if you're interested. And it actually pays pretty good, but it, uh, it'll be kind of a short-term thing. And he says, well, what is it? He says, well, actually, our gorilla died yesterday, and he was one of the big attractions here, and we've got a gorilla suit. If you'll put this thing on and just be in the cage, but, you know, it's like an eight-hour, ten-hour day thing. Uh, but the money's really good, and we'll have to do this and kind of keep keep this going, you know, until you know we get uh, another gorilla. And uh, so the guy needed the work. Says, "Yeah, I'll, I'll do it." So he's he's in there the first day and kind of kind of it's hot and everything. He's trying to get used to it, and then he he kind of starts getting into it after a while, and he's swinging on bars and stuff, and he gets carried away and flips over to the cage next to him, which is where the lions are. So immediately the lion looks at him and starts walking slowly towards him and the guy starts screaming <laughs> in the gorilla outfit, help, help. And then the lion looks at him real closely and says, shut up, stupid, or we'll both get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so for most of you, that was a joke and not an illustration, apparently. <clears throat> the, the point is, is that uh, he was pretending to be something he's not. He was living a life of pretense. And certainly sometimes, even as Christians and in this world, there's a, there's a pretense that's going on. Uh, very interesting. We went to the theater the other night. And, and um, of course, you, whatever you're seeing, you have to sit through all the co coming attractions. <laughs> one of them is from a year from now. It's coming a long ways away. But almost every one of them had this apocalyptic kind of a thing. The world is coming to an end. Of course, it makes good drama for Hollywood and so forth, but uh, it's on the minds of people, and yet people don't really live their lives that way, and sometimes we don't uh, as, uh, as Christians uh, either. Uh, just to borrow a couple lines from Ravi Zacharias, he says, each man plays similar games of pretense in many arenas of life. We attempt to build civilizations not knowing what it means to be civilized. We try to be philosophers when we do not know the master philosopher. We portray artistic perceptions without knowing the master artist. We moralize life, but we don't know the moral lawgiver. There's a pretense uh, in this world. And he went on and then quoted um, the great writer, philosopher, G.K. Uh, Chesterton. And he said, was asked, uh, what do you think of civilization and he replied, I think it's a great idea. Why doesn't somebody start one? Uh, and later on, after seeing a, seeing a series of articles on what's wrong with the world, he wrote a short letter to the uh, editor and wrote, Dear Sir, regarding your article, What's Wrong with the World? I am. Yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. A lot of people don't realize the problem with the world is us in our sin nature there's a whole world that's out there that's under pretense that it does not exist and that somehow we're going to bring, bring peace to this world. Uh, things are going to change in this world. We can make this world a, a better place. And those are great aspirations. Uh, a really fine British uh, theologian, John Stott, uh, made this comment. He said, many of the happenings of civilized society would not exist if it were not for human sin. Uh, but in regards to that, a promise is not enough. We need a contract. Doors are not enough. We have to lock and bolt them. The payment of fares is not enough. We have to be issued a ticket, which is punched, inspected, and collected. Law and order are not enough. We need the police to enforce them. We cannot trust each other. We need protection from one another. It's a sorry state of affairs because we live in a fallen world. We have sin natures, and yet people pretend that that is not the case. But our study in Revelation is all about the fact that that is the case, and the only time there will be peace in this world is when Jesus Christ returns to establish his kingdom. And as Christians, we need to realize that, not live in the pretense of the world, but live for the real world, which is 
uh, still future coming. And certainly that's the, the theme of the book of Revelation. Jesus is coming back again to planet Earth to establish his kingdom. And it's meant to this study to glorify him, even as I think we did in our worship this morning. Let's look at verse 8. And the first point here is that Jesus' deity is implied in the title given to the Father. And, uh, and that's in verse 8. Speaking of God the Father, it there says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And certainly, again, uh, we see the overriding theme right here, the titles given to, uh, to God. Alpha and the Omega, first and the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Uh, so really, again, it's speaking of God in terms of its in entirety, in terms of how this implies Jesus Christ. Uh, very interesting, and this is one of those uh, verses that you can have a lot of fun with your Jehovah's Witness friends who deny the deity of, of Jesus Christ. And uh, I've done this many times on my doorstep. Sometimes they get interested. Other times they get really mad at me. And here's why they get really mad. I read that verse to them and I said, who is that speaking of? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. And they'll say, that's Jehovah God, or we would say God the Father. I'd say, yeah, I, I think you're right about that. Now, he, that's mentioned again over here in Revelation 21, verse 6. I turn over a few pages, and there it says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, who is the Alpha and the Omega there? And they say, once again, that's Jehovah God. And I would say, I agree. Of course, I would say that's God the Father. And then I take them one chapter over to Revelation 22, verse 12. And there it says, and there's a tip off. If you've got one of those red letter edition Bibles, it's in red. It says, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now, I say, who in the book of Revelation is coming quickly to give every man his reward? And very often they will say, well, that's Jesus. I said, I think you're right. Now, what does the next verse say about the one that's coming quickly, Jesus Christ? He says of himself there in verse 13 of chapter 22, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And I say, now, who does that make Jesus if he has the same name, the same title, the eternal one as Jehovah God? And then they say, we don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they, they used, I actually had get one guy get really mad at me. But uh, even in this title, again, we have the same, same title, same message used, this the God of all eternity is certainly God the Father, but he certainly is Jesus Christ as well. And the book of Revelation is full of references to the deity of Jesus Christ. Notice the other term that's used of God the Father, the Almighty. That is, he's able to, to do anything for us. And uh, that term is used many times throughout the book in chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 11, 15, 16, 19, uh, and 21. Uh, the Almighty. God the Father, who is from all eternity, who is the Almighty, is the one that can help us. Because then, remember, in context, this is the church that's being perse persecuted. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it's at, at the, <coughs> again, mid-900, or excuse me, about 95 <coughs> A.D., when, uh, when John is writing this, and there's a worldwide persecution going on, and these churches needed to hear this and be encouraged, it should be encouraging to us as well. Let's so look at the second thing. So his deity is implied. And secondly, Jesus gives instructions for John to write. And that's in verses 9 to 11. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last and... Uh, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So certainly uh, John is given instructions, and uh, we would note that instructions as the last surviving uh, apostle, and uh, all the others have already been uh, martyred uh, for their faith. He is the last one. But notice how he introduces himself. It says, 
uh, as your companion, uh, as your brother. A companion in what? In the suffering that the church was going through at, at that time. It's not, I'm the last apostle. I'm the last one here. I'm the last one with this kind of uh, authority to write scripture and, uh, and so forth. Uh, John's uh, an older man at this point, uh, obviously a very humble man and somebody that was suffering himself. Now, uh, Hippolytus, who was an uh, uh, early church historian, tells us that uh, John, when he was first uh, arrested uh, by the emperor, was first uh, boiled in oil to try to get him to renounce Jesus Christ. But apparently, not only did he not renounce his faith, it had little effect on him. It didn't burn him up, didn't kill him, didn't do any of the things it was supposed to do. Uh, and so then he is exiled to the uh, island of uh, Patmos. Uh, not exactly, again, Club Med uh, in the Mediterranean, but uh, 10 miles long, 6 miles uh, wide. Basically, it was a big rock. No vegetation. There wasn't much there. Uh, he's actually working in, in the mines as, a, as an older guy. It wasn't real pleasant. He's a guy that could say, you're suffering. I'm a companion in, in your suffering. can re relate totally to where they were at. Secondly, John hears the instruction in a trumpet-like voice behind him. And this is Jesus Christ uh, speaking. And uh, as far as we know, this is the first time that the, the Lord has spoken to him audibly like this in some 60 years since Jesus, again, death, resurrection, and then his uh, ascension. And here the Lord commissions John to write the book, send it to the seven churches. And we looked at that last week and talked about the fact that there were seven actual churches, but certainly there are also churches uh, that, uh, that represent all churches and, uh, and all believers. So again, there's an implied deity to Jesus right off the bat, and then instructions to write. And then uh, where we'll spend most of our time in verses 12 to 19, Jesus gives an important revelation of, of himself. And even before I read this, uh, even as we sang that song, that he would be magnified, again, that's the point of the book. Uh, that we don't see Jesus any longer as the, uh, as the hippie-looking guy with a robe and sandals who, again, portrayed as the suffering servant who came and was brutalized and died on the Roman cross. Uh, the, the point of this the, is the revelation of Jesus Christ, revealing to him, himself to us in his glorified state. Uh, I think it, the obvious intent is that it should change how we worship the Lord. <laughs> It should change how we view Jesus. When we pray in Jesus' name, if we have a better understanding of his power and his authority, uh, we, we would get a very, very different glimpse. I won't do this, but I could do this. There are guys in this church that have tremendous authority in terms of their, their position at work, what they do for, our, for our, our government, for our country, and it's national defense in many cases. Others just in the corporate world. And, uh, and you just know them as whatever their first name is. The guy that does whatever he does here at the church. I, I could actually change your view of them very quickly by telling you what I know about them and what they do for a living. Uh, I know that if I mention it to, uh, to others, uh, they are greatly impressed and their view of that person is really changed. Now, I'm not going to do that. But I could, and it would change. That's the, I, the idea here, is that when we begin to see Jesus the way he is revealed here, it should give us a better understanding of his position, his power, and his authority. And that should mean everything in the world to us, because that's who we pray to in the name of, rely upon in our time of need, in our time of help. We're not under persecution, but it's not to say that living the Christian life is not without stress, and not without its own tribulations, and hopefully this will be meaning to, meaningful to us. Verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were, were white like wool, as white as snow. Uh, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on, on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So the revelation, we first say, came in what John saw. And, uh, and we talked about the, um, the language of the book of Revelation. We, we're, we're getting into it now. Uh, all of the like and all of the as. We talked about the fact that uh, uh, it, one of them is used 22 times, the other time 65 times, a simile. Uh, it, it's, uh, again, symbolic language. Uh, and, and that's what we see here. On top of that, we have the metaphors that are given, which is, again, descriptive in a way without the use of those two terms. So we have to determine, is it a metaphor or not? I think clearly all of this is very symbolic language, and we're, we're going to look at that. But again, the revelation came in what John saw. Uh, Jesus here is pictured as somebody with tremendous honor, tremendous authority. He's pictured as a king and as a priest. He's also pictured as a judge in terms of his description. And uh, first we note that John saw one like the Son of Man. And uh, we mentioned this when we were in our study of Matthew, but this is Jesus' favorite term used of himself. When Jesus would make reference to himself and would he use a messianic title, he could have said many things, this is the thing he said about himself more than any other phrase. And it's a direct reference to Daniel chapter 7. And, uh, and so uh, Jesus was constantly bringing to their mind, I am the Messiah. I am the predicted one. I was the one that Daniel spoke about, and Jesus himself quoted Daniel uh, on many occasions. But let's read that, and that vision of Daniel, Daniel 7, verse 13. There, in, Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days, and was led into his presence. And again, the ancients of days is just a reference to God the Father. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Again, Daniel is seeing something that is future tense. We refer to as the millennial kingdom. There will come a time, again, Jesus comes back to planet Earth, and all of these references throughout the Old Testament that says, and this is what the kingdom of the Messiah will be like, it will be like that, exactly. And, uh, and all of the things will happen. So again, Jesus uh, it again reveals himself, and John says, I see him, and he is the Messiah. He is the Son of Man. He is the fulfillment of everything that Daniel said would happen uh, of him. I see it now, uh, whether I saw it before or not, we don't know, but he certainly wants to make it clear for us. In terms of the idea of the title, the Son of Man, Jesus is the Son of Man. Uh, he, he did come and he was born uh, again as that babe in Bethlehem and grew uh, in that perfect sinless life. And, uh, and he had to do that. Uh, Jesus has to be the perfect God-man. If he was simply the perfect man, he could die for the sins of perhaps one person, but he certainly couldn't die for the sins of the whole world. He had to be the perfect God-man so that the price paid would be sufficient to cleanse every person from every, every sin that they had ever, ever committed. Not that everybody is forgiven, but the Bible is very clear that he died and his payment of his death was sufficient for, for all sins. All, all men, women, and children still must personally call on the name of the Lord to be forgiven. Secondly, we see that uh, John saw him clothed with a garment down to his feet, a gold sash around his, uh, his chest. We don't see a lot of people running around like this today. You might find it very unusual. But John knew exactly what it meant. Priestly garments. He is our, the son of man. He also is our great high priest. Uh, Hebrews 3, 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Uh, Jesus is there. He is interceding uh, for us right now. You might be glad to know when other people are praying for you. Uh, I've just suggested that we keep 
keep Jake and keep Leslie in, uh, in prayer because they're in arm's way. Whether we do or not, Jesus will. Uh, whether anyone else does or not, Jesus will. He is our high priest who ever lives to intercede for us. In fact, uh, that's why the writer of Hebrews in chapter 7 says, that's why he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. John sees it. We can read about it, but John is now describing it uh, to us. Thirdly, John saw his white hair, again, which symbolizes his, uh, his purity. And that's uh, uh, many references we could go to, but one that we often sing is from Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as, as wool. And I've mentioned before, I think the, that uh, there, there will, whether it's everything or not, there certainly will be, be many things and maybe most of the things of heaven, I think will be a constantly reminder to us of what Jesus Christ did for us. And whether we see his hair, again, this is symbolic language, but the idea of his purity, when we see him, certainly we will see him as someone who is absolutely pure. And that purity will remind us of what he's given to us uh, in terms of a right standing before God. The fourth thing, he saw his eyes like blazing fire, which uh, again, the, the idea of the eyes means that he can see that he's got knowledge, he's got uh, complete knowledge of, of everything that enables him to judge righteously. And that's the idea of his eyes being like fire. It's the idea that what he's seen here on earth is, uh, is worthy of his judgment. Again, Hebrews 4.13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And certainly a lot of this, again, we see him as the king, we see him as the priest, but he also is the coming conqueror and so forth, but he's coming to judge a Christ-rejecting world, uh, and that is seen in, in the fact that his eyes are, again, symbolic language, are like fire. And uh, what John sees is uh, the Lord of glory who's about to bring judgment on, on planet Earth. Again, fire often used to represent judgment in the Bible. Uh, a lot of references to Hebrews to there because that book talks about Jesus and his uh, great, exalted, high priestly role. But uh, Hebrews 12, 25 See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he is a promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. These aren't, aren't always verses that we, in our minds, focus on a lot. Again, our opening illustration, even as Christians, we can live the Christian life in some kind of pretense as though, again, Jesus is meek and mild, you know, suffering Savior, and never come to grips with, no, that, no that's, that's who he was, who he became to die for our sins. That's not who he is now. That is not his position now. That is not his authority now. That is not what is about ready to come upon uh, planet Earth when he returns. The idea of judgment continues. The fifth thing, John saw his feet as burning brass. Again, Bronze or brass are always a picture of judgment as well. It was a brazen or a bronze altar that the sin offering was, was brought to where sin would be judged. Uh, and uh, John knew exactly what this meant as he tries to describe Jesus symbolically in this world. So he is coming to judge. And he's coming to judge a, a very evil world system. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it seems like it's getting darker all, all the time. He's also coming back to, to judge the nations, and uh, we've talked about that before. We'll get into it more uh, in the book. Uh, during the tribulation, the great tribulation period, there will be a tremendous holocaust against Jews all over the world, and according to uh, 
I believe it's Zechariah, two-thirds of them will be killed in the, uh, in the process of this tremendous persecution. There will be those that will, will turn against the Jews. There will be those that, that help them. Uh, and Jesus says, uh, and, uh, and again in the Olivet Discourse, talking about that time period, if you give even a cup of cold water to one of these my brothers, somebody else, a Jew suffering in that time, he says, it will be like you've given it to me. So Jesus, when he returns, will bring judgment against, Matthew 25, nations and whether they were anti-Semitic or pro-Semitic. How they treated Israel, uh, how they treated the, the Jewish people, that is certainly part and parcel of the book. Again, because once the rapture takes place and the church is with him, there's a point in time after that. Again, the Antichrist comes on the scene, establishes a, a covenant with Israel to rebuild the, the, the temple. And there's, there's just more discussion about that all the time. And I, I just read the other day on one news source uh, out of Israel that, uh, uh, that uh, Prime Minister ben, Benjamin Netanyahu, that's one of the things that, they, they, that he's already brought up in terms of his government. Is there a way to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount? And at least that's one of the concerns of, uh, of Hamas and, and some of the other people in the, in the uh, PLO that he's trying to uh, deal with it this uh, very time. So uh, very interesting. But Jesus comes back to judge a world system, to judge nations, and certainly to judge uh, individuals in the great white throne judgment. The sixth thing, John heard the sound of many waters or rushing waters there in verse 15. Uh, and again, trying to describe the, the voice of Jesus when he spoke. Like the North Shore on a really big day. <laughs> if, you, if, you ever, if you've ever, if you've ever heard it from uh, from the water on a really big day, uh, it's it's pretty awesome. If you've been in the water on a big day, it's even more awesome. It's it's kind of uh, frightening actually. It's just kind of it just it just so the waves out there just absolutely thunder when they when they snap off and, and, and break. But you would get the same idea standing next to a, a large a large waterfall. Uh, but again, it's the idea of when he speaks, he speaks with power and authority, and he must be heard. There, it's like, what did you say, Jesus? I didn't quite get that. No, it's when he speaks, he will be heard, is the idea. This whole image that, that John has seen, again, there is the, that he is our great high priest, and he lives to intercede for us, and, and we're so thankful for that. But you can see that a lot of this descriptive language is everything to do about that he is the king, he is the conquering king, he is coming back, and he will judge this world. And uh, all of this is meant to put the fear of God in us, which is the beginning of wisdom. If you, if you get that figured out, that you're supposed to fear God, then uh, uh, that's going to help in a lot of, uh, understanding a lot of things uh, in life. The seventh thing, John saw the sword from his mouth, which certainly represents the, the word of God. Again, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is, is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents uh, of the heart. I just want to say I have no idea what that means. I just think it's incredible. Uh, and there is no creature hidden in his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. But apparently, the word of God has the potential to, to penetrate the deepest places of our hearts. Even it does right now as I read it, as you read it. Always the question is, do we respond? Or James says, are we like a man who looks in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what we even look like? Or are we somebody that then hears and does uh, the word of God? But it will penetrate. It's just a matter of how we react to it. But again, when Jesus returns, this is how he destroys his enemies. And we'll see that as we get to Revelation uh, 19. But notice in, uh, in chapter 19, verse 15, where the same phrase is used, there's something that's added on there. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. So uh, again, uh, this, this image of Jesus, in a sense, is not exactly meant to be comforting. Now, it's comforting when, we're, when he's out front and we're on, we're on his side. <laughs> you know? But it's not meant to be comforting if you're on that side and he's coming in, uh, in judgment. And, um, and, and I think all of this should have an impact upon how we view people and whether they know the Lord or, or not. 
should we listen when Jesus speaks to us through his word? Uh, absolutely. Should we take seriously the admonitions that he's going to give the church uh, as we go through chapter 2 and 3? Certainly, because those conditions existed at the time of John's writing, and the clear implication is that uh, they always exist throughout, throughout all of church history, and they, they exist today. The eighth thing is John saw the Lord's shiny countenance. His countenance was like the sun shining in its, its strength. Again, reminding us of the transfiguration in Matthew 17, but also the prophecy of Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, where it talks about the son of righteousness. There Malachi says, but to you who fear my name, uh, a title for Jesus, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. <laughs> Must be Kobe beef he's talking about there. Uh, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So again, notice the contrast. Jesus uh, pictured coming back again as the son of righteousness. His countenance, uh, again, uh, just this bright light, John's trying to use descriptive uh, language uh, to try to convey what he's seeing. Uh, there's this idea that he brings healing in his wings and judgment at the same time, uh, as he will, again, as we get to Revelation 19. Uh, for those that have cried out, again, in that last time, even though there's persecution, uh, there will be the, uh, a national revival among, among the Jews. Uh, and they will cry out as, as a nation nationally to uh, recognize him as the Messiah. That's what brings him back. But obviously there are many Gentiles that are hearing the gospel during that time all over the world that are turning to faith in Christ as well. And when he returns to them, it's like healing in, in his wings is what he brings. But those that have rejected them, it's going to be a, a horrific time. Again, meant to change our, our image of, of Jesus. There was a kind of a popular uh, bumper sticker in, in the 70s. I think it was put out for, uh, by maybe Jews for Jesus, one of the organizations uh, uh, like that, it has a ministry like that. But it said, uh, it simply said, uh, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. I don't know if anybody ever, I see one once in a while. It's very faded. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, in the I, the sentiment was there, I think, to try to be a witness. Oh, well, really? Well, who's your boss? You know, or, you know, maybe that would somehow open a door to somebody else that was a carpenter or somebody else that was Jewish. Uh, I don't know. But uh, I want to say emphatically, John is very clear. Jesus is not a Jewish carpenter. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's the image that's meant to be changed here. That's who he came to earth to be. We don't think of Jesus as being a little baby in the manger, although there's a lot of people at Christmas time that want to keep him there. They're good with that. Baby born in the manger, all the animals around, how sweet. What is it? How's that song go? You know, pe there's a lot of people that want to keep him there, uh, but uh, obviously he didn't. He grew, uh, and he went and died a horrible, agonizing death uh, for our sins as he said that he would. But that's still not who he is. He's not Jesus on the cross anymore. Uh, again, he is the glorified Savior. And John is doing the best that he can as he sees Jesus and hears his voice after possibly 60 years of not hearing it. He's doing the best he can to try to describe to us exactly what he's seen. But what he's seen is the returning judge of the world who is a priest uh, and a king. And then... Uh, the second thing here is notice the reaction that came in what he did. <clears throat> John fell at the Lord's feet as, as though he were dead. I, I've got a feeling that uh, at some point in time when we're, uh, I don't know if that'll be our reaction the first time that we see Jesus in heaven. I got a feeling it might be though. But you know, it, it, you know it's, I, I don't know. You know, we have all the, the songs we sing, you know, we're going to run and embrace him and, you know, different things. So maybe that'll, That'll, that'll be it, you know, but uh, it may be that, we, that this is our reaction as well. It seems to be the reaction of those that get little glimpses of Jesus in his glorified state. And again, <clears throat> back to, to the, the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 7. Uh, look at Daniel's reaction. He says, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for, as he sees Jesus' glorified state. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled and hid themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw the great vision. 
And no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Uh, that's, that's the reaction here. Probably uh, an appropriate one, but probably one that you didn't have to think about it. It just, it just, it just happened. And, um, and again, I, I think that's so important. We, uh, in our study in Proverbs, uh, and I, I mentioned the verse uh, a moment ago that the uh, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And Solomon writes that at the, at the outset, of course, in the, in the first proverb. He's trying to convey to his son practical ways to live a, a life before the Lord and, and so forth, and uh, very practical. But basically he's saying, but if you don't fear God, you're not going to get anything right in your life. It's not just the beginning of wisdom. Is the, in a sense, it's literally the fear of the Lord is the beginning of everything in terms of our, our thought life, how we view the world, how we view our neighbors, raising our kids, handling our money, all these practical things of business and everything that, uh, that he goes uh, into. Uh, and uh, I think we certainly probably have, have lost that. Now, one of the illustrations that we use, because sometimes we'll say uh, the fear of the Lord is a, a reference to having a awe, a respect, and a reverence for God. And that's true, and we should. But you know what it also means? It means you're supposed to be afraid is what it means. And um, the illustration we used at that time was a, a guy who was um, taking pictures uh, uh, at the Grand Canyon. And, uh, and basically, he's, you know, he's going to, uh, can you go back a few more steps? <laughs> can you go back? <laughs> if you, they're getting closer to the, the precipice. Now, they could turn and look, and they could be in awe of, uh, of the beauty. But they could also look and go, oh! And it's both of those things. Both of those things at once when we come before the Lord, when we, when we pray to the Lord, when we worship the Lord. It's meant to be awe, reverence, fear. And, uh, and again, I think C.S. Lewis is one of the people that does such a wonderful job in the Chronicles of Narnia painting that picture as Aslan being like the Lord Jesus Christ as a lion, but he's not just a lion. He's like a giant <laughs> lion. And they absolutely fear him as well as love and, and adore him. It's a great, uh, great illustration. Uh, let me read to you um, what Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, because he kind of nails this. He says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We knew, we knew him. We can write about him. We can read about him of what he was like when he was living here in human flesh on this earth. But Paul says, no longer, no longer. That's not how we regard Christ. That's not how we see him. That's not how we view him. Now, the, the other third thing here is that the reason not to be afraid is given. Now, to fear God is one thing, but there are other things that because we know God, we don't have to be afraid of. Uh, and they are one of the fact that Jesus holds the keys or authority over death and Hades. And again, the idea of holding the keys means the person with, with the authority. You know, there's kind of this uh, uh, warped uh, uh, view of the world that, uh, that somehow the devil's in charge of hell, as, as though he's the guy with the authority holding the keys. No, he's in the worst place. He's the chief prisoner. He has no authority. Uh, Jesus Christ is the one that holds all authority over death and over Hades, over hell. We don't have to fear that uh, as one of his children, as one of his followers. Secondly, we need not fear life because he is the living one. And uh, sometimes there's things in life that do cause us to fear, <laughs> fear the apprehension of what's happening next, what's going on. My circumstances seem uh, out of control, but... Uh, Jesus is the living one. He has authority over death and Hades and, uh, and over this life as well. We need not fear death, again, because he died and is alive, and therefore he's conquered death. So we fear and have a reverence for God, but uh, we don't fear death. We don't fear, shouldn't fear the, the future and things that are going on and happening. He's, he's the living one. He's the one that's conquered death uh, and gives us eternal life. Uh, and then next, the record of what he is to write is stated, verse 19, and we mentioned this in our opening, it's the outline of the book, uh, verse 19, write the things which you've seen, that's what we're going through right now, chapter 1, he's seeing the vision of Jesus, and the things which are, chapter 2 and 3, the things that are currently going on uh, in the churches there in Asia Minor, 
and the things which will take place after this. And then that same word, after this, metatauta in the Greek, is how chapter 4 begins. And that's how the book outlines itself. So it's nice of the Lord to give John the outline of the book right off the bat. So there's an implied deity to Jesus, instructions from him for John to write, important revelation of himself. And then fourthly, Jesus reveals the uh, mystery of the images that he's already given, and that's in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And uh, again, so that's explained. Uh, the menorahs, the lampstands are representative uh, of those seven churches. And the seven stars that we already saw again last week. Again, those seven spirits or messengers or angels that are before the very throne of God that we're going to see uh, many other times uh, uh, in the book. Notice in chapter 2, verse 1, he begins by saying, <clears throat> To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands or, or menorahs. So Jesus there pictured already walking in the midst, in a sense, of the church. The menorah represents the church. Jesus is seen walking in its midst. He's in the He's in the midst of the church. Now, if we had a, if we had a bigger stage, <laughs> we would have a little table up here somewhere with our golden menorah purchased in Jerusalem that would uh, be up here. And a lot of Calvaries have it because of this verse, because it's the representative of the church given in the book of Re Revelation. Uh, and it's a representative of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in the midst of the church. Uh, and, uh, and it's kind of a reminder uh, of that, walking in the midst of, of the church as he is here today as well. Sometimes we perceive it more than other times. Don't you find that to be true? Sometimes you're, you're in a meeting, you're in a prayer, you're in a church service, and you have a sense that God's presence is, is really here. I really sense God's presence. I, I don't know that's why. I think sometimes maybe because of what's going on in our own hearts and minds or the needs that we might have or whatever it might be, we, we kind of just become more aware. But the point is, the Lord's always here with us when, when we're meeting. That's, that's what this text is, uh, is, is saying. And I think sometimes, especially reading the Gospels, uh, the reason that he is here uh, is because he wants to minister to his people. Uh, and in terms of which people, well, according to the Gospels, it's the one with the greatest need. Think of Jesus going into the synagogue there in Capernaum, right on the, uh, right, literally right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee there, uh, and going in, and his critics were there, and his critics knew that Jesus would immediately gravitate to the purse person with the greatest need. There was a guy there with a withered hand. There was a lot of people in the synagogue, although that synagogue is about the size of our, our fellowship right here. It's, you know, sometimes we, I've been there, it's, it's, it's about this size. So, you know, Jesus walks in, it would be, it's not like thousands of people. Is he here today? I don't know. It's about this size. He walks in, it's like, hey, there he is. Where's he going to go? What's he going to do? His enemies, his critics knew he's going to go right to that guy because that guy is hurting that's a guy that is in the worst condition of anybody else here. All we got to do is watch that guy. That's where Jesus is going. And of course, they were right. That's where Jesus went to. You remember the story? And he, he tells them to uh, stretch out his withered, withered hand, and he, he does, and he's healed. And of course, then they're upset because he's healing on the Shabbat or on, or on the Sabbath. Uh, again, a great picture for us to remember. Jesus is in our midst in the church, and I think he still is here when we're attentive enough to realize that he is and desires to minister and especially to those that are that are hurting the most let's go back to our context though what is he what is he in the midst of the church of primarily here in the book of revelation judgment he's walking in their midst and this is what we're going to get to next week <clears throat> the first church there in ephesus we just read verse one he's in the midst and now he's saying john write this because this is what's wrong with this church and you'd better tell them and tell them now and they're just going to go and this is what's wrong with this one and you better tell them and tell them now and then he's going to go right through seven churches that really represent the conditions and the problems that exist in our church or the churches today 
There's, there, there, if you're on your search for the friendly church or the perfect church, uh, it doesn't exist, uh, according to Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and by 90 AD, the church is pretty whacked already. And I, I've said uh, two semesters of church history in graduate school, which was interesting. I wouldn't say it was good. Did you like church history? No, it's terrible. <laughs> I found it interesting, but it's terrible, the things that have gone on in the Church of Jesus Christ over the last 2,000 years. It's, it's radical. We've got, we get so far away from the, the, the basic concept that's in the Gospels, uh, in the book of Acts. And that's why we want to study them, come back to them, but again, to really comprehend what's going on in the world today, what should be happening in our church and in our lives. We need a magnified view, an exalted view of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And that's, again, the primary purpose of our, of our study.